Thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you very much, Klaus, for bringing me from Biel back to Bern. Uh, so I'll come uh, bring up the similar topic uh, that Professor Gunter talked about. It's uh, what should we do when we have a chondral defect, uh, uh, when we do acetabular surgery, it is an issue. And um, I will present to you this uh, animation that you probably have seen many times before, but I like it because it's so illustrative what happens in cam impingement when we flex the hip and the bump squeezes itself into the acetabulum and it will cause this shearing injury uh, of this very typical defect that we see when we perform this kind of surgery. So we go in either open or with arthroscopy and we see the defect and then we think, well, well what should we do? Should we just do a more complicated treatment with harvesting and replacing the cartilage, should we just take it away or should we just leave the bump? And the idea, what we're uh, having a look at is that where to go and how to proceed and look backwards in uh, maybe finding some solutions in how we should uh, do in the, in the future. So in open surgery, this is the way how it looks like. We have these chondral flaps. They can be of a significant size in these hips and we can go in and open surgery with a probe and very nicely see and feel the, the quality of the cartilage and also determine uh, the size of this defect. In arthroscopy, we uh, see similar findings. This is when we start. So uh, this is also when I start, I go in uh, with very little water or no water at all and it gives you a very nice overview in the joint and it lets you evaluate the hip very nicely without any, any blood in the beginning. And we can palpate uh, the defect and we can define there, is it a carpet or how, how is the cartilage? So in, in both um, techniques nowadays, we see these injuries very well. Uh, Martin Beck has uh, presented a classification of, uh, of these defects from a uh, stage uh, zero would be a normal cartilage, um, visually not altered. Uh, grade one would be a roughening of the surface, fibrillation of the surface. Uh, stage two would be uh, partly uh, thinning, so this is sometimes a little bit hard to evaluate, but when you go in with a probe, you would feel that, that you probably have a less quality. And then we come to the interesting uh, defects. This is uh, like starting delamination or the carpet phenomena, so when the, the, the carpet would start to move within uh, the joint or from, from its uh, underlying uh, bone uh, to cleavage lesions, and of course then the full-blown defects when there's no cartilage left. Of course, these defects we like to avoid. We'd like to have a preoperative diagnose in the MRI or also in in the, in the x-ray to, to see when it's a large, full-blown defect, maybe then the indication for surgery was made a little bit borderline. So we'll focus now on the, on the stage uh, three and four defects. But that's not the only thing. It's also very important to define the size of your defect because in the mechanics of the hip, it makes a really big difference whether or not the defect is in a size that the femoral head itself is still well contained in the joint so that we don't see any micromobility or we don't see any contrast moving into the posterior part of the joint or if it's a large defect where the head already migrates within the defects. I think this is too big difference and it's important. So first to define when you do search, where is the defect and also define the size. And there are different uh, classifications proposed here. Also, I think the, the best and the more intuitive is uh, to have this clock face uh, grading of the defects where it is because it also corresponds to the clock face uh, definition of uh, the femoral head. So this would be the 12 o'clock position when you look into the hoi and then anterior, always anterior, would go towards the 3 o'clock position and always posterior will go towards the 6 o'clock position and there you can very well define where's your defect and what you're talking about to compare. So there's a long uh, experience of treatment of cartilage defects in the knee, and it all start, started a little bit with uh, the publication from Pride. It was an extremely short publication in the JBHS. It was it's not, not really a publication. It was more like a communication of uh, what he did with his drilling in the knee in the 1959. And then it was redefined uh, by Stedman in the beginning of the 80s, where he combined the microfracture, the, so the drilling, with the rehab protocol, and he started up this in, the, in his clinic in Vail, and it became extremely popular uh, because he treated a lot of high-level uh, athletes, and so it became a really popular treatment in knee surgery for, for coronal defects. The idea is that you cause a uh, clot with uh, stem cells, and this clot will then produce a uh, type 1 collagen scar within the, within the joint, and this is well described in the knee. Now, uh, there are alternatives, and in the hip, uh, several techniques have been published, have been used, have been tried. 
uh, debridement only, and then there's a whole lot of, of reproductive surgery that you could try to do with a, with a cartilage. Some require two-stage uh, procedures that we heard from uh, just recently. Uh, you can also use allograft. The problem with allograft is that you, you, it's, it's hard to really define the shape of the acetabulum, so there you have to go and pick the right spot where you would harvest your cartilage. Now, there's no real long good data on long-term follow-up on these dif different procedures, and except this one uh, systematic review that had a look on, on these different procedures uh, compared to uh, just microfracturing, and they showed that there was no big difference. Now, recently, one issue came up on uh, the results of microfracturing that they worry with, it, especially in the knee surgeon, that over time and when they come towards the really long follow-ups, that maybe initial good results could de deteriorate over time. So that's an issue, and uh, this is something also you wanted to have a look in this study. So the questions we had was, does microfracturing or prior drilling under a chondral flap change anything on the outcome of the hip. So we wanted to see, does it reduce the rate of joint degeneration? Does it reduce the rate of total hip arthroplasty? And does it improve clinical outcomes? And we had a look on a series of patients that were all treated with surgical hip dislocation for femoral acetabular impingement that had documented chondral flaps uh, between 1999 and 2007. They had all stage three or four chondral uh, damage. And uh, we could include 98 patients, and we could put them in these two groups. So the study group was all patients that we had performed additional pride drilling or microfracturing underneath the coronal flap. And then we had the control group, where we just had put, put the cartilage flat back. I mean, we did bribe it a little bit, the, the rims, but basically we just put it back, did the impingement surgery, and then left uh, this flap by itself. We had uh, 32 males. Uh, 36 patients in the study group and uh, 62 patients in the control group. We had 88% males in the, in the study group and a little bit less uh, in the control group. The size and location of the defects had, was described in the OR report. So at the time we had this form that in, in all surgical location case we filled in the form and we, we noted where exactly the, the defect was, was shown. The mean age at surgery was 32 years, and the follow-up was a little bit different between the two groups. We had seven years in the study group, and a little bit longer was eight and a half years in the control group. Preoperative uh, tunnies grade was comparable in both groups for grade uh, zero and one, and we had one case, uh, tunnies two, in the, in the control group. And this is uh, now again how these defects were described. So it was on the clock face position. We noted from where to where we saw the, the flap and also the depth from the acetabular rim prior to rim trim, how much uh, then this uh, flap would then protrude into the acetabulum. And there was no uh, significant difference in the size and the location of the flap between the two groups. The results in the study group, we had one patient that uh, uh, was conf uh, uh, total hip was implanted versus eight patients in the control group. That was significant difference. Uh, the tunis grade was, uh, so one case uh, changed from tunis one to tunis group, uh, two, and in the control group it was a little bit different. So we had three, three patients that moved from tunis zero to tunis one, and then of course the one with the tunis grade two where roller started bad, it, it went even worse. This was also significant difference between the two groups. For the clinical outcome, we didn't see any difference. So looking at the Mel Daubigny score or the Harris Hip score, uh, we had 79% um, in the study group and 62% in the control group that had a good or an excellent result at last follow-up. Plotting this on the, on the survival uh, plot was uh, in the study group, we had a survival of 96.8% at seven and a half years follow-up, and one patient reached the end point with a total hip implanted uh, in this time, in time frame. And looking at the control group, we had a survival rate of 80% uh, percent after 7.5 years, and there we had eight hips that would converge to a total hip. We had one hip with a progression of osteoarthritis, and we have four hips with a bad clinical outcome. This is an example of an 11-year follow-up uh, where we performed uh, uh, this treatment. It was um, the surgical hip dislocation, and then you, hear, you see here the 11 years follow-up uh, with a very good clinical result. And uh, he had a Mel Daubigny score of 18, so it was an excellent result. Of course, we also had the unfavorable results. This was a, a patient that went 
pretty, pretty okay until five years post-op, and then at six years, uh, then the total hip had to be implanted. And this is something that we sometimes see in that in the beginning goes well, and then all of a sudden maybe the, uh, then the clinical outcome can deteriorate. There are, of course, limitations to this study, and they're mostly related to that it is a retrospective study, so uh, we didn't do a randomization of the two groups, obviously, but we didn't see any big difference in the, in the demogra demographics between the two groups, except the time to follow up, uh, which was uh, significantly longer in the control group, and we had significantly more men in the study group versus the control group. And there can also be a bias in the, in the definition and the description of the chondral flap. It was all retrospectively taken from the OR reports, and I think this, can, this could be basically a, a major uh, limitation for the study, but of course it's, it's hard to tell. We didn't see any difference, but we cannot really be sure about that. In discussion, uh, uh, there, w there is a systematic review out that, would look, that looks exactly at the same population group, on microfracturing for treatment of chondral defects in uh, acetabular chondral, uh, in femoral acetabular impingement. And they had a look on uh, several studies and they included 135 uh, procedures. Uh, they had a fairly shorter follow-up than in our study and they saw they had a comparable clinical outcome. So they could say that actually the, the outcome is, is good in the microfracture group, but they didn't look at the, at the radio radiological outcome. And I think this is a very important point. And it shows also a little bit the quality about the research. So even in, the, in a systematic re review, they couldn't really tell how, how the, this hips then proceeded uh, radiologically or the, the progression of the osteoarthritis. Whereas in our group, we, in, in this study, we saw that we had a 2.6 uh, percent of patients uh, with a total hip and 5.3 percent with a progression of the osteoarthritis. Uh, important would also be to have a look at the quality of the cartilage and there we've heard yesterday about the po possibility to, per to perform degeneric studies especially in these regions where these flaps were treated and this is exactly what we're trying to do at the moment. We have MRIs of most of the patients that were included in this study of the study group and so we're in the process of having a look at the, at the degeneric and maybe be able to, precise, to define a little bit more precisely what happens with these chondral flaps. In conclusion, it seems that microfracturing below a chondral flap in uh, FII surgery increases the cumulative survival rate at the seven and a half years follow-up, and it seems that the clinical outcome is not uh, influenced by this treatment. Thank you very much.